So I am not your speaker today, but you do have somebody very, very special. And, um, and she, uh, she's a reverend, and we haven't heard from her in a while, and I'm excited to hear from her again. So everybody, just, just uh, be expected, get ready to hear the word that God's put inside of her. And so we are going to welcome the Reverend Heather Hall. How's everybody doing today? Bless you. <laughs> Good. It looks different up here than at the old place. <laughs> You're higher. <laughs> well, anyway, well, I'm gonna. Huh? Oh, <laughs> I'm gonna start out with prayer. Well, Father God, we just come before you today, God. We just thank you for your word, and we thank you for your service today, God. Though we ask you just come and have your way, Lord, and I just ask you just. Uh, Speak to me as your oracles of God, and I just ask for Holy Spirit just to come and have its way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, today we're going to learn about what it means of being a uh, sorry, being an instrument of God. Okay, so the title of my message is "Being a Chosen Instrument." We're going to look at what it means and what it entails. So we're going to go to Acts chapter nine. We're going to start with verse 1. It says, And Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went unto the high priest. So this is Saul before he became Paul, before he was converted. Okay? And desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. So Saul, at this point in time, he was very mean to the Christians. He persecuted them, he murdered them, he imprisoned them, um, just all kinds of meanness that you can think of. And he even um, held the coat of Stephen while they were stoning him. You know, he washed and all that stuff. And so that takes a lot of um, to do those things. But in verse 3 it says, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined around about him a light from heaven. Now, do you guys remember when we first came to this building and Pastor Brian said about many of us would be having our suddenlies? Well, Paul had, or Saul had a suddenly at this point in time by the Holy Spirit. And then it says, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? <clears throat> and he said, Who art thou, Lord? So when, when somebody hears the voice of the Lord, even though they don't fully know who God is at that point in time, they're going to know that it's the Lord because you can hear that audible voice. You just something inside of you know that it's well, that's God speaking to me. And so Saul knew that. He's like, Who are you? He said, and Jesus responds back, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks or the goats. And so if you guys don't know what that means, it's like when God's trying to deal with you about something, but you're being disobedient or in rebellion, then um, you're going to put kick against the, against the goats. That's when pain comes and all this stuff. And I don't know how to, Pastor Brian explains it a lot better, but you just cause pain upon yourself. And that's what Saul was doing. And so, and then verse 6, it says, And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, fearing a voice, or hearing a voice, but seeing no man. So can you imagine at that day and time you hear this audible voice and, and Saul is like hearing this and he's in a place of get ready to repent and all these men are with him. But could you imagine like looking up, where is this coming from? And their, their face is probably just like, oh my gosh, you know, like in the movies or whatever. <laughs> I don't know, 
what is pictured in that lady? <laughs> but in verse 8 it says, And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him to the hand and brought him to Damascus. So right now Saul is having a Damascus Road experience with the Lord. Now what does the Damascus Road experience mean? It means a sudden insight that radically changes one's beliefs. So right now, right there, Paul, or Saul at the time, he is being changed from what he was doing before and persecuting Jesus, where now he's becoming a believer. Okay? Verse 9, and it says, And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there were a certain disciples of Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am with thee. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. So right now it's showing you right, right now that Saul is repenting. He's in a place of complete repentance to Jesus. And verse 12, it says, And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, have you not heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints in Jerusalem? He's like, you want me to do what? Go to this person that is a murderer and, and just persecute? I'm a Christian. He's going to persecute me. He's going to hurt me. But, you know, obviously Jesus will not put something upon you that will put you in danger. He's going to protect you. And then it says in verse 14, And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel, or another word for that, a chosen instrument unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, when I read this like a long time ago, I thought Jesus was going to make him suffer because of all the bad things that he did a long time ago, you know, before he repented. But the Bible says when you do, when you sin against the Lord and stuff, and you truly repent, he says that he casts our sin as far as east, as east is from the west, and he remembers them no more. So that doesn't line up with scripture, that thought. But what that means is, is that God is going to um, cause Paul to go through a time of suffering, a time of change of who Saul once was to where Paul is going to be in the future and the destiny that he has for him. So God calls us to go through these times of suffering in order to change us to, to the destiny that he has for us in the future. We've got to learn through learn things during those times of suffering. That's what that truly means. So, um, I want to focus on how God said Paul was a chosen vessel or instrument of God. And so, um, in the beginning of Acts, chapter 9, we read that Paul persecuted the Christians, as we already talked about. Um, but Paul also, but we also see that Paul had a Damascus Road experience, and we discuss what that truly means. A sudden insight that radically changes one's beliefs. So once he came to a place of repentance, Paul's eyes were open to the things of God. So when you have that Damascus Road experience with the Lord, or you just need to have a repentant heart, your eyes become open to who God is and what he has for you. And then let's read on to verse 17 through 20. It says, and Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus that appeared has sent thy way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell upon him his eyes as it had been scales. So scales, from, scales fell from his eyes. And he received sight and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was, was Paul certain days with the disciples, which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, and he is, that he is the Son of God. 
So once he started become, once he repented and just Ananias did his job and baptized him and all those things, he started preaching the word of God. You know, and all these other people are like, what? You were this way and now you're preaching the word of God and they're kind of confused. But to God be the glory. So, if you, let's see here. The Lord said to Paul, who was a chosen vessel or instrument of his. So what does God's instrument, what does a chosen instrument mean to God? It is a tool or piece of equipment used for delicate work. So we are God's tools. We are his handiwork, okay? God uses his tools to bring others to faith in Jesus Christ. So we're all called into the ministry of reconciliation, right? To bring one another to Christ, to proclaim God's word. And Jeremiah 29, 11 says that he, thoughts, that he has thoughts of good for us and not of evil, but to give us a future and a hope. He has a plan and a purpose for each and every single one of us. So we were all created for a purpose and on purpose. That's been instilled in this house. And we have a specific purpose that God wants to use. So when you have, like if you think of a shed or a garage that's full of these tools, that each one of them has a specific use or purpose. I can't do what God created you to do, and you can't do what God created me to do. We are all God's tools, his instruments, right? So we were created for that purpose. So since I've been coming here for a while and stuff, God's taught me how to use certain tools. You know, I can use an edger now, I can use a saw, I can use all kinds of things. All of us ladies know how to use <laughs> tools. <laughs> all these leaders, you know, if you're willing, God will show you what to do. He'll teach you new things. And so but that's the key, if you're willing. So each of us have these tools, and they have a specific purpose. So if, if I wanted to, like, cut down a tree... I'm not going to use a screwdriver or that would take forever or well, I don't even think you could, you know, so that's kind of goes along with, I can't do what you're going to do, what God called you to do and all that stuff. You know, if you're going to till the ground, you're not going to use a hammer. You're going to use a tiller or some kind of a tool to cut up the ground, right? You have to find that specific tool or instrument for that specific purpose or use that you need it for. Um, God chose us. So if you turn to John chapter 15, John 15, verse 16, it says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. So first, we didn't choose God, ultimately. He chose us first. He already knew what he wanted us to do in the beginning, before time began. He knew what era that we were supposed to be born in, and he knew the destiny that we were going to have, that he fulfilled for us to do. And so he chose us first, and then we chose him. But he called us to bear fruit and do you remember that we learned on Wednesday night that through John Revere that he, he uh, planted that tree, that orange tree, and it took time for that fruit, you know, to multiply and produce? Well, as you, as you uh, work and allow God to work in your life, it takes time to produce that good fruit that he desires you to have in your life. It takes time. And you have to get that fruit by being in the Word of God, by being in prayer, by spending time with Jesus. That's how you cultivate those things in your life in order to bear those good fruits. So that is our purpose as well. You turn to Genesis 28, verse 3. Genesis 28, verse 3. It says, and God Almighty bless thee, and make thee fruitful, and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people. So he desires us to multiply. You know, when you first plant a tree, as we learned on Wednesday, it 
maybe it doesn't produce something at first, but then after a few years, one fruit, two fruit, and then all that stuff. Well, same thing with us. He desires us to multiply. Turn to Matthew chapter 22, verse 14, and I'm just going to share something with this verse that, a revelation that came forth um, into my spirit that God expanded upon. So turn to um, Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. And then it talks about how it says, many are called, but few are chosen. Okay? Now, I've read that verse, and I've heard it ever since I've been a Christian, probably. You sometimes you hear it, and you, don't, you just don't get that revelation. But just recently, I, I received a revelation of what it meant, and it was like a light bulb went off in my spirit, man. So many are called, but few are chosen. So what does that really mean? So imagine you have a room full of born again believers. They're all called to do something of the Lord. They're all called. But only God's going to choose just a few. Why would you, why do you think that? Well, how can you say that, Sister Heather? I, I have a destiny. I have a purpose. God called me to do this, 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 this. Well, you know, He's only going to choose the ones, okay, I see this person, they're working on their character. They're going to be becoming more like my character. They're becoming, they're desiring to be more like me. Oh, I see this person. They're allowing me to take them through a time of suffering. And not so that they can see them squiggle or wiggle or anything, but to, just like Paul did. It's order, he takes you through that time of suffering in order so that when you reach your destiny, you'll have that those tools for that time in your life where God really wants to use you and pour out of you. Oh, I see this person. They're allowing me to take them through a trial. Oh, I see this person. They're finally getting it. They're, they're actually doing what I've asked them to do for years. They're actually working on things and changing. Right? Yeah. I've been, <laughs> I've been there. That's, that's how I, this message came about. God has been dealing with me on things and now I'm finally facing them and desiring to become more like him. And, you know, and uh, my coworker, I didn't realize, sometimes you don't realize how many people see you or are watching you, but like she saw me and I was getting out of the car, walking to work and stuff. She's like, boy, you're sure walking fast. And I'm like, well, yeah, because I just started working out and stuff. Because she's like, well, normally you're walking with a limp, you know, because so, I'll have pain in my feet and things like that. But I have to get myself into healthy shape and get back into doing things like that. And God's been dealing with me with that. So I'm working on it and stuff. And then recently she saw me this week. She's like, and I was filling my water bottles and stuff before I went to work. And she's like, well, hey, you got a smaller soda. Normally you have an extra large 40 ouncer. <laughs> And I'm like, well, yeah, I'm trying to work on cutting that back, too. She goes, well, that's a lot of changes all at once. But see, that kind of encouraged me. You know, I'm like, wow, you know, I'm working on that. People are seeing it. And that's not the only thing that I have to work on. There's many ultimate things. And, you know, there may be some habits that you have that God's wanting to break you free from. It could be something as simple as when you put your laundry on the floor, when God wants you to put it in the hamper. You know, it may not be something huge or big, but there was one thing for me recently, <laughs> within the last couple weeks, or maybe last week, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, I was doing some work for the Lord for here at the church and stuff, and I chose to do things the hard way and stuff. And I could have had it done and done right the first time around, but then I had to go back not once, but twice, in order to do it, make it right. So then I texted Pastor Brian and said, I'm going to break free of doing things the hard way. He goes, amen. <laughs> and it's just been years, okay? That's something that God's, it may sound simple, but those are big things to God. It's, the Bible says well, it's a little fox is a spoil of the vine, right? In order for God to take you to where he wants you to be, you got to work on those things. And so when I realized what that verse meant, I started praying, I'm like, Lord, I said, I don't want to be among the many. I want to be among the ones that are chosen. And when you pray that, God will hear you if you mean it with all your heart. So here we see God has chosen us. He's desiring to use us. 
So, and like I said, we are all called to a ministry of reconciliation. So what does that mean? 2 Corinthians, I think you all know it, but 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. Second Corinthians 5, verse 18. It says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. So first he reconciled us, and he expects us to, to lead people to Christ, to reconcile them to Jesus Christ as well. That's what we're all called to do. So, we are to proclaim that good news. Go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. It says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. So that means that he has instilled gifts in each and every single one of us. Um, things that he desires to flow through us or to do. You may have the gift of laughter or the gift of joy that somebody needs or whatever it is. There's no gift that's too big or too small. Turn to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25, verse 14, we'll start there. And it says, and I know you guys heard this before, but <clears throat> for the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. <laughs> and unto, unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To every man according to his several ability, or his own ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same, and made them other five talents. So he's multiplying what God gave him. He's using what God gave him, those gifts. And likewise, that had received two, he also gained other two. But the one that received the one did the behold in the earth and hid his Lord's money. So he was just afraid. Oh my gosh, I gotta protect this gift. I gotta protect this. Nobody takes it from me and all that stuff. But the other two, they were just willing to use it for, for the kingdom of God and all that stuff. So turn or go down to, um, let's see here, verse 21 it says, his Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee a ruler over many things. And verse 22, He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest, me, deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, weeping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not straw. And I was afraid, and went and hid my talent in the earth. And then verse 26, it says, His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and soft for sinner, thou knewest that reap. Anyway, he's just saying, How dare you? And he just went into um, inter eternal damnation, all those things. So you don't want to be that person. Okay? You want to be the ones that you, but God gives you, you want to use it for his glory. So as I was studying this on Friday, something entered into my spirit, which I never think about. I'm not a history person at all. And do you remember the saying from John F. Kennedy? It says, ask, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Well, what if you turn around, ask not what your church can do for you, but what you can do for your church. Yeah. Amen? So just turn around. Use it, for the, use it for the Lord. And so that just part of service. So God can take a nobody, a nobody, and turn them into somebody. Okay, God can turn that nobody into somebody. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we're going to read out of the Message Bible on that one. Uh, I got to go to my other Bible, my phone Bible for that one. 
please. First uh, Corinthians chapter one. Verse 27 in the Message Bible. Okay, let me have 27. Almost there. Okay. It says, take a good look, friends, at who you were when you got called into this life. I don't see many of the brightest and the best among you. Not many influential, not many from high society families. Isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that the culture overlooks and exploits and abuses? Chose the nobodies to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies? So that's also saying he takes the, what happened with King James, the wise things, and I don't know, I don't know that well. What is it? Yeah, it takes the foolish to confound the wise, yes. That makes it quite clear that none of you can get by with blowing your own horn before God. Everything that we have, right thinking and right living, a clean slate and a fresh start comes from God by way of Jesus Christ. That's why we have a saying, if you're going to blow a horn, blow, it, blow a trumpet for God. Yeah, so I thought that was really neat how it kind of made it into a different a uh, version for you to understand that he can take a nobody and turn him into somebody. And he does that because it gives glory to God. Right? right? That's what it's all about. Um, Ephesians 2.10, it talks about, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So like, like I said earlier, he already had a plan for us where he wanted us and it's for us to do those things that he already planned for us long ago. So when God called on Paul in Acts chapter 9, he was first called Saul, but God changed him into Paul. He gave him a new name. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, that when you that when you repent of your sins, you become a new creation in Christ. You develop a new DNA in your body, and you have Jesus' blood through your, through your veins. And you become royalty. You have royal blood through, going through you. So when we become born again, he changes us into his image. And our identity should be in him. And this is an area that I've struggled with about how I saw myself and where my identity was. Your identity, a lot of people think it's in your work or it's in your, your uh, giftings, like if you're a... Uh, artist or something of that nature or whatever it is it's not that's not where your identity comes from it's not in your wealth it's not in your position it's in Jesus Christ it's that's how you need to see yourself so <clears throat> and you got to start seeing yourself as that instrument of Jesus so you are loved and you are chosen you got to tell yourself that in the mirror every single day, that you're loved, that you're chosen. God does not choose you based on your performances. He doesn't call the equipped. He will equip you. You just got to heed the call. He chose you to be a child of God. John 3, 16, for God's love of the world, and he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And you got to tell yourself that you are chosen and that you are wanted. Jesus wants you. Turn to 1 Peter, my last verse. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, 1 Peter 9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So therefore, he's already said, I've chosen you. So it's up to you, that I'll leave you with this, whether you want to be among the many and stay where you're at, not change, just, or if you want to be among the ones that are chosen, that God desires to choose, but you got to do the work. All right? I'll leave you with that. Thank <laughs> you.
Good word, amen. amen. I want to be among the chosen. Or not the, the, the few. The few. <laughs> 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 it's me. <laughs> yeah, I was right. Yeah, I want to be chosen. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. How many of you don't have to do the good leg of medicine? <laughs> Amen. Yes, every one of us are called, but you decide whether or not you are chosen. It is completely, completely up to us. That was a good word. Very, very good word. And that's the season we're in right now. God's waiting for, for those that want to be chosen. He's waiting for those that, that are ready to say yes. So, anyway, but um, how many uh, or We'll go ahead and take prayer requests and then we'll close. But uh, Sister Bob. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Brother Kyle's not with us today. His family suffered a loss. So. Anybody else? Sister Scarlett? My sister and her daughter got a shot. Oh, goodness. Like Rebecca. Anybody else? Sister? Anybody else? All right. Well, let's go ahead and pray. Father God, Lord, again, we just we thank you, God, Lord, for today and this house and your word, God. And, and Lord, we thank you that, that you have called every single one of us, God. But Lord, it's up to us as to whether or not we're chosen, Lord. And Lord, I just pray that that your word just settles deep down in every single one of us, God, Lord, that we don't just hear your word that you spoke to us today, God, Lord, but that we we act upon it, we settle it into our hearts, God, Lord, and Lord, that we move upon it and, and do what we need to do to be chosen, God, Lord, because you're looking for those that are ready to say yes and that are ready to, to just do what you've called us to do. And, and Lord, we just, uh, Father God, Lord, I just lift up, uh, Brother Kyle, God, and his family, Lord, and <clears throat> Lord, we just pray that, that you will just be with them uh, through their loss, God, and Lord, your word says, it says in Matthew 5, 4, that blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted, God, and Lord, we just pray that you will just send your <clears throat> your comfort and peace to the to, to Brother Kyle and his family, God, and Lord, and Lord, we just pray that um, Lord, that you'll just wrap your arms around them and comfort them, Lord. And Lord, if any of them don't know you, God, Lord, I just pray that, that, that Lord, just through tragedy, God, Lord, you can just, um, you can just make ways and do things that, that only you can do, Lord. And, and Lord, we just lift up all those, uh, just all of our many family members, God, Lord, that, that, that don't know you, God, Lord, that we're contending for. And, Lord, those that, that do know you, that have strayed away, God, Lord, we lift them all up to you. And Lord, your word says that that it's your goodness that draws us to repentance, Lord. And God, Lord, I just pray that every single one of them, God, Lord, that they'll see your goodness, Lord, and that they'll just they'll draw to you, God. And Lord, that those that, that, that are prodigals, God, Lord, I just pray that you'll just bring them back to the right mind, Lord, that they... They'll remember what it was like to be in your presence, Lord, and just the joy and the freedom and the peace that they felt when they were with you and in your house, God, Lord. And Lord, we just, we um, we call each and every one of them out, God, Lord, and we call them for you, God. And Lord, we just, we're putting an expectation on that, God, Lord, that, that you'll just bring them in, Lord, and Lord, that you'll just save their souls. And Lord, we just lift up Sister Scarlet's sister, God, and then Lord... Uh, and again, Lord, we just pray that you will just comfort her, God, Lord, and, and, and uh, this gentleman's family. And, and Lord, um, Lord, I just pray, God, Lord, just for peace, Lord, and, and Lord, that you'll just, just again, just wrap your arms around them and comfort them, Lord. And, and God, Lord, we just, uh, we continue to lift up our pastors to you, God, Lord, we just pray that you'll just be with them uh, when they travel home, God, Lord, Lord, we just pray that you just 
Keep your angels surrounded in the battle. Lord, we just pray hedge of protection upon them, Lord. And Lord, we just pray that you just, just keep them safe as they come home, God, Lord. And Lord, we just continue to lift them up. We continue to contend for healing in Pastor Brian's feet, God. And Lord, your word says in 1 Peter 2, 24, that by your stripes, he was healed. And Lord, we just put an expectation on that, God, Lord. And Lord, we just command those tissues to grow and and nerves to, to go back to how they should be and just all infection to go back to the pits of hell where it came from. And Lord, we're just believing, God, Lord, for just complete 100% healing to manifest in his body in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we just pray that you just encourage our pastors, God, Lord, and Lord, that even though they were, they went home for, uh, for to say goodbye to love on God, Lord, I just pray that it's a time of rejuvenation and restoration and just rest to God. And, and, and Lord, we just pray that, that you would just encourage them and you just give them strength that only you can give God, Lord, and joy and, and, and wisdom, God, Lord, to say you and guide your people. Lord, we just pray that you just be with us throughout the week. And Lord, we just love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.